I'll ask you to bow with me in a word of prayer. Father, once again, we bow before you and we recognize our need, our need to have you open our hearts and our eyes, the spiritual reality of our life so that we might know and understand what you say. Attend to our time, attend to your word, allow it by your grace to not return to you void as you have promised and may it change us in an everlasting way we pray in Jesus name, amen. Well, it's great to be back this morning. We're returning to our study of Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10. What a, what a wonderful study we've been having over these past several weeks. Um, I would venture to say that many of you would bear testimony to what God has done in your own lives as you've been here and hearing what God has been teaching us through the Apostle Paul all the way from the beginning, but really ever since we even approached into chapter 8 and chapter 9, and now here we are in chapter 10. And right here in chapter 10, we are looking at the massive contrast there is between the righteousness of doing and the righteousness of believing. The righteousness of doing and the righteousness of believing. I said to us last Lord's Day that what we are hearing is the most important thing that we will ever hear. I'm not saying that as hyperbole. I'm not saying that as an exaggeration. Because what you do with what you are hearing from this very text is going to have an eternal consequence for your life. That is not exaggeration. That is reality. That's a pretty weighty statement to make, isn't it? That's a pretty heavy thing to say. That sounds almost arrogant. Pastor, you mean that there is nothing else that I could hear that might be just a bit more important to my life? The answer I would say is absolutely not. No, nothing has more importance in your life than what you are hearing in this study right here. You can go a lot of places, you can gather as a parent all the information that's out there and the books that are out there on how to raise a family. And none of that is going to be as important. What you might hear from science, what you might glean from medical research, pales in comparison to what you will hear in this text. Gaining education of any matter of subjects to help you increase your income level or increase your intellectual prowess among your colleagues will still be less important than what you hear here. Why? Because none of those things deal with your eternal state. None of it can save your soul. The tragedy, here's the tragedy. The tragedy of saying that right now, right here today, is that some, someone, some, maybe even multiple people will, who are here right now, will walk out those doors that are behind us after we're done, and they will leave this place having heard all of this, and they will leave this place in the same condition in which they entered this place. They will reject it, reject what's being said as if it's unneeded and if it is untrue. So for that we pray. We pray even now that God would come against that in your heart. That God, by His gracious mercy, would cause the blinding sinful scales to drop from your eyes right now so that you might hear with understanding and embrace this saving truth. Nothing is more important than this right here. God has, by His grace, ordained, you may not have thought about this this morning when you woke up and your alarm went off, but God has ordained that each of us be here this morning to hear this truth. 
Now, with that said, we are returning to where we left off last Lord's Day in verses 5 through 10 of Romans chapter 10. This section obviously goes through to verse 13. I trust we'll get hopefully to there even this day. But I want us today really to focus our attention primarily on verses 9 and 10. These verses obviously follow along with what we have already heard in the previous verses. If you were not here for that, if you have not heard that, you can go online and listen to those messages. You can ask the guys in the back to make you a CD, but get those messages if you have not heard them. The Apostle Paul has been comparing for us the massive, the vast chasm and difference between the righteousness of doing and righteousness which comes by believing. As we begin, we need to be reminded that the difference between those two polar entities is not simply an intellectual difference. It is not semantics of of thought. It is not in any kind of way that way. It is not simply a matter of definition whereby they are both true, but it just depends on which angle you view them from. No, more importantly, the difference between them is an eternal difference. The difference between these two ways of gaining righteousness is the difference between where each one ends up. The final ending place of each one of those realities. One being in heaven and the other being in hell for all all eternity. That's the difference. Righteousness by doing as we have learned, is an impossible task. It is absolutely impossible. It is impossible for any of us as human beings to fulfill that task in order to gain righteousness. Why? Because two unchangeable truths must be acknowledged and practiced in order to gain righteousness by doing. You have to acknowledge these things and you have to practice these things. First, you must know what it is that God requires that you do in order to attain righteousness by doing. You have to know what God requires. And just in that, many people fail already. They think that they're doing things that will be good enough to gain righteousness by doing, but they don't even know what it is God requires. But even worse than that, even when people know what God requires intellectually, even though they might know the standard of God, they must then also practice what God demands in that standard. In order to attain the necessary righteousness that God requires in order to be in His holy presence and to be acceptable with Him forever and ever and ever, in order to be in heaven... You must follow the demand. And as we've learned, the demand practiced is absolute perfection. It's absolute perfection. In fact, it's even what Peter says to those in Galatia, Bithynia, and the areas surrounding that that he was writing to in 1 Peter. He said, be holy, for I am holy. Peter wasn't talking. He's quoting God. You know where that said that? You know where God says that? In Leviticus. In the book of the law, be holy for I am holy. Leviticus 11.44 and following. He's saying, look, do what I said and you'll be holy. But it's not attainable. Why? Because you have to be perfect in every way. So when God says, be holy for I am holy in the sense of the law, he's saying you must understand in order to gain righteousness by doing, you need to be perfect in every way. And since we all know, by not simply what the scriptures say, that should be enough. But people say, oh, that's just an ancient book. Oh, it's just written by men. Oh, that's just a book uh, that men draw, drew up. But we know it's God's word. God says, you be holy for I am holy. So since we know that to be true, and we know by our own experience of living, that no person is perfect, then the way of righteousness by doing is an impossible proposition. It's impossible. If you're a created being, you cannot be perfect, and therefore the way 
of works righteousness only ends up in eternal punishment. That's the end of the road. But, as we heard last time, there is another way. And praise God there is. Praise God. That there is another way. There's another way to gain the necessary righteousness that we need. And that is through or by faith. By faith. Notice what verses 6 through 8 says. The righteousness based on faith speaks this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Don't think that you can do that. Or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up. Don't think you, you can do that or even need to do that. But what does it say? The word is near you. It's in your mouth, in your heart. What is that? The word of faith, which we're preaching. It's the word of faith. And so we've already understood the first way to, to this, in, in this comparison, righteousness by doing, the first way, that is the hopeless way. Why? Because it's impossible. But the second way is the hopeful way. Because it is possible. Why? Because salvation is completely by faith alone. By faith alone. Not by works at all. Paul says this is what we're preaching. That's what we preach. This is what Christians preach. This is essential in the gospel. And so we proclaim it as fact. Now, now, I just want to kind of give a footnote here or a side note here for us as, as we begin our time in, in thinking about the Bible in general. When you read the Bible, the Bible speaks, and I'm going to use a, a word that maybe you don't know or maybe you've heard but you really don't know, in the indicative. It speaks in the indicative. The indicative, we, we know that if you've been studying Greek, the indicative mood and all those kind of things. What does that really mean primarily? It means simply this in its primary function. It means that when the Bible speaks, the Bible makes declarations. The Bible declares things. It doesn't suggest things. It declares things. In other words, it presents absolute facts. And we're going to look at some of those facts this morning. And when the Bible demands in those facts, it, it lays out facts in the indicative when it and demands that we believe, it demands we believe those facts. That's the imperative. So the Bible goes from the indicative to the imperative. It lays out facts and then it commands that we believe those facts. And so what we are going to hear this morning, we have to remember that. The Bible is telling us facts. Absolute fact. And then it is commanding us to act upon it. And what is that acting upon it look like? What is acting upon this fact look like? Paul says it looks like faith. It's belief. It's belief. We believe it. The Bible declares the gospel. And every person who has ever taken breath into their nostrils is commanded to believe it. Why? Why? Because, we can go all the way back to chapter 1 for our answer. Chapter 1, verse 16 and verse 17. Because, well really verse 17, because in it, in the gospel, in the fact of what God has said in the gospel, in it, Righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. That's the why. So for anyone to be righteous in the presence of absolute holiness, for anyone to stand righteous before God and not be consumed by His absolute holiness because holiness and sinfulness cannot be, remain in the same place, then we must believe the facts as God has provided them to us. So in order to be saved, we must believe the gospel. We must, in its basic sense, believe the gospel facts. The facts as God gave them. 
And even though that's true, sadly, over the years in evangelicalism, there has been a debate going on, shockingly as that might seem, within quote-unquote Christendom, even what we might say is orthodox Christian churches, there has been a debate over the years about what is the bare minimum that someone must believe in light of the gospel, in light of gospel fact, what's the minimum that someone must believe in order to be saved? Is it just believe in God? Is it just believe in Jesus? Is it an understanding that you're a lost person? You believe that you're lost and therefore you in that are saved? Does it belong to some good church who preaches the Bible faithfully? What is the, the must? What is the minimum that must be believed in order to be saved? That's the debate that's gone on in the church. And I want to submit to us today that right here in verses 9 and 10, God, through the Apostle Paul, declares the conclusive answer. Now, before you are too quick to answer, because all our eyes immediately go to the text, which I hope you would do, and gladly you did, because we open our Bibles here. And you look at that, and you go, okay, that's clear. There's the answer. Before you give your answer that that's the answer, be careful. Because there's more there than you might think. So how is someone saved? How can we tell that someone's profession of belief is actually a possession of salvation? Well, we are told here in these verses, and you notice the two primary action words here in both these verses, confess... And believe. Verse 10, believe and confess. So we're told in these two verses that you confess and you believe. Or you believe and you confess. It's there in verse 9. It's there in verse 10. You notice it even in verse 11. He whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Verse 12, there's no distinction between Jew or Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, abounding in riches to all who call upon Him. That's a synonymous idea to the idea of belief and confession. And then in verse 13, you have the same thing. Whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. So in a basic sense... Since there is a need for all people to gain the necessary righteousness in order to stand in the presence of God's holiness, then they must, in a basic sense, we must confess and believe. That's the basic sense of, of the idea for salvation. Confess and believe. And nothing could be more important than that, could it? Confess and believe. Think about it with me. I mean, by the providential, loving hand of God, we are here today. God, by His grace, gave us breath into our nostrils in this morning. Our eyes opened up when the alarm clock went off or when our young child cried to us or when the dog whined to get out of the kennel because he needed to go outside, whatever it was. And we are here today and we are hearing what is being said. Some of us as unsaved people. I can't believe we said that in a church. Unsaved people in a church, yeah. Some of us unsaved. You walked in here as an unsaved people, according to the mercy of God, still on your way to hell, still in a moment's notice, God could remove the breath of life from you and you would end up in hell. Providentially, God has brought you here and here you are and you could leave here as a citizen of heaven. How amazing would that be? But you must confess. You must believe. That's what the text says. 
Now, this is a great statement. Some are here hanging in the balance. We are not simply told the facts. We are not simply given the indicative. We are also told the imperative. We are commanded to believe. And so right here is a definition in its basic form of saving faith. And I submit to you there's nothing more important than that, is there? Nothing more important than that. So what was it then did true Christians confess and believe? What, what is it then that those who are actually Christians, what, what, what was it that they truly confessed and believed so that they were saved? What is it that must be confessed? What is it that must be believed if someone is to be saved? That's the question we need to ask. That's the reality that Paul is getting across to his Jewish brothers and sisters who his heart is broken for in order for their salvation. Because they believed in a righteousness by doing. If I just do the law, if I, if I carry out the statutes, or whatever the rabbi tells me, I'll be good enough. Paul wants them to know differently. And so the first thing that Paul says here is that we must confess You notice Jesus as Lord. Jesus as Lord. Now, we have to understand a few nuances here in this text. The first thing is confession is not simply just words spoken. Confession is not just words spoken. That's what we tend to think about when we hear the word confess, or if someone is giving a confession, they are speaking words, and that word is their confession. We think about those words. But confess actually means more than that. It actually carries greater emphasis than just the words. In fact, the word here in the original language is the word homologeo. Homologeo, it's two Greek terms put together, which is not uncommon in the Greek language. Homologeo. Homo or homo, which means the same. The same. We know the word homo sapiens. You know what a homo sapien is? Look to your left, look to your right. Those are homo sapiens. You, us, we, humans. We're the same. We're not dogs. We're not gorillas. We're not monkeys. We're homo sapiens. We're the same. We're humans. We're same. We're people. So that's the first word, homo, same. The other word is lageo, which is original root is lagos. What's the lagos? Word, word, or words. So homo lageo means same words. This is the translation for the word confess, same words. The idea, when it's used here, is the idea of complete and total agreement. It's not just words, it's complete and total agreement with everything. To have the same words or to say the same thing is to be in complete agreement in every way. So to have the same words, as a Christian tells us in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. So when we are confessing our sins as Christians, as we walk through life and we fail, we confess our sins, we are saying the same thing as God says. We are in agreement with God's assessment of those issues. In the same way, with the depth that God has for it. And so what the Bible is telling us here in Romans chapter 10 and verse 9 is that we are going to be saved. If we're going to be saved, we must confess. We must homologeo. We must be in complete agreement concerning something. We just stopped at confession. We must be in complete agreement. That if you are in complete agreement here, you're out of the heart. Proverbs says the mouth speaks. And so that's why he says with the mouth. Confession isn't just a word thing. It's a... It's an issue when I'm in complete agreement, when I'm in a homologeo session. It's from my heart. This is an issue of the heart. 
So what does he say? What are we confessing? He says we must be in complete agreement concerning what? Jesus as Lord. By the way, the little word as or is in your, in your uh, Bible translation is not there in the original language. You, you might as well just put an equal sign right there. We confess with our mouth, Jesus, equal sign, Lord. Jesus is Lord. And we know that that agreement is with God concerning Jesus, Lord. It's with God. You say, how do you know that? Because that's who's the subject here. If we confess with our mouth, Jesus, Lord, and believe in our heart, God did these things. So we're agreeing with God about this stuff because of what He says. He's the judge. He's the one who can cast our soul into hell. And so we must be in agreement with Him concerning Jesus. Jesus said in Matthew, don't fear men who can kill your body. Fear Him who can not only kill the body, but cast your soul into hell forever. That's who you fear. This is God. So let's be clear then at the beginning of all of this, right? To be a Christian, to be a real Christian, you have to deal with Jesus. You have to deal with Jesus. You can't be a Christian and not deal with Jesus. And now, just that fact alone on the surface eliminates a whole lot of people who claim they're going to heaven. There's a whole host of religions in the world that think they're going to eternal glory when in fact they want nothing to do with Jesus. They either deny that He existed or they don't think that it means anything or they've even, in a small way, attached themselves to a name where they spell it the same way, J-E-S-U-S, but it isn't the Jesus of the Bible. They believe in a God, but they ignore Jesus. So right here it's clear. The gospel, the gospel of God, and he's the one that matters, clearly says that we must deal with Jesus first. You have to deal with Jesus. And the road to glory goes through him in some way. And so the Christian faith is not about some kind of system of morality in order to which we attain it's not about that. It's about a person. And what does it say about that person? Paul says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord, Jesus is Lord. So the first thing that Paul declares, the first thing that God is declaring again, he's declared it in multiple books before Romans, he's declaring again, this confession is that Jesus is Lord. Now that implies a whole lot of things with those words. It implies a whole host of things. In other words, there is no salvation for anyone without being clear about and being in full agreement with God about the Lordship of Jesus. That's what confession means. That's what we're confessing with our mouths. That's what we're saying from our heart and why our mouth is speaking. We're agreeing in full agreement with God that Jesus is in fact Lord. He has a Lordship and that carries a whole host of implications for who that means He is. In other words, what does it mean, again, to confess Jesus as Lord? Well, first thing we have to understand is that when the Greeks translated the Old Testament, what you know, some of you might not know, but it's called the Septuagint. The Septuagint. When, when the Greeks translated the language from the Hebrew into Greek, the word for God was Yahweh, which translated as Jehovah. Yahweh. When the Greeks translated that, you know what word they used? Adonai, which is Lord. So Jehovah, Yahweh in the Hebrew Old Testament, when you read the same text in the Greek Septuagint, you're going to read Lord or Adonai, which is the name by which God desired to be known. 
Jehovah God. It's his name. It's his name. Lord is his name. Lately, I was reading through the book of Ezekiel in the Old Testament, and I was intrigued by the fact that over and over and over again, chapter after chapter after chapter after chapter, God tells Ezekiel, go prophesy against these people, against these people, against Israel, and this and that and the other thing. And always at the end of the judgment, he said, and then they will know that I am the Lord thy God. In other words, by what I'm doing, by my judgment, by my restoration, by these things that I'm doing, then you're going to know that I'm the Lord. It's amazing to me. So here in Romans chapter 10, verse 9, Paul is using the same word as the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, Yahweh. And he describes Jesus with that term. He is Jehovah God. He is... Lord, Lord. So when Paul declares that a person must confess Jesus Lord, or Jesus is Lord, or as Lord, equal sign Lord, he's saying that to be a Christian, you must fully agree with God the Father that his Son is God. He is God. This is as clear a a statement about the divinity of Jesus Christ as there ever was in all of Scripture. This is like Jesus standing before the Pharisees and saying, Before Abraham was, I am. Which is what God said to Moses to go tell Israel. Tell them, I am sent you. You know what that means? Existence itself. In a literal sense. Existence itself sent you. This is just like Paul saying that. Unless you confess that Jesus Christ is God, you cannot be saved. This is a declaration of the divinity of Jesus Christ. You cannot be saved unless you confess that reality about Jesus. Jesus himself declares that. Jesus himself proves it with his miracles. And he demonstrated it on the cross. And so the word Lord here is not so much a title for Jesus. It's not so much that it's the Lord Jesus, and that's his title, like General MacArthur or whatever you want to say. It's not so much that. It's his name. It's who he is. It's the very essence of who he is. He is Lord. He is God. Isn't it amazing? Isn't it amazing? Right here this morning... We've just scratched the surface. I mean, we just came in and, and you, you know, you, you scratch a little bit right at the surface. Isn't it amazing that all, now we know the, at, right out of the gate, the first thing you've got to know about Jesus. He's God. And yet over the years, it's amazing, as years pass with the modern day of evangelicalism, there has been such a heated debate coming in the so-called orthodox Christianity over the years, arguing about what to confess about the gospel. What do we say? They say that his lordship doesn't matter when it comes to salvation. You just need to accept him as savior. Later he becomes lord. That's what you hear people say. That's ridiculous. He can't become something he already is. He is lord. He doesn't become lord. Whether you acknowledge him as Lord in every area and submit to Him for who He is is a whole other issue. But the fact of the matter is He is who He is. Don't blame your disobedience on God and the fact that you can go around thinking that you can live carnally your whole life and claim God and it'll be okay with God. No, no. Because confession is complete agreement with God, right? Out of the heart the mouth speaks. If my heart is speaking it with genuineness in my heart, then I'm believing it. And if I'm believing it, what's that doing to me? Changing my life. I'm walking by it. I'm living by faith, as the Bible says. So when, when somebody says they can be a Christian and, not, and Jesus isn't Lord, that's a damning lie. A damning lie. I don't care how many letters they have behind their name. I don't care how long they've been a biblical quote-unquote scholar. If they get that wrong, they're wrong. 
Without the confession of Jesus as Lord, there is no salvation. And so you see, the question to ask ourselves is this. What do I believe about who Jesus is? What do I believe about who Jesus is? Do you believe what the Bible declares about him? Do you believe that he's God? That he's Jehovah? Because that's what true Christians confess. Now, since Jesus is that, since he is Lord, then there's a whole bunch of implications that are included with that name. What are we also confessing when we confess that? Well, if we confess Jesus is Lord, then we're also confessing that Jesus is the creator of all things. If he's God, he created everything, just as Colossians 1 said, there's nothing that has been made that hasn't been made except by Jesus Christ. He made it all. He's the creator of all things. So when we say he's Lord, that's included. He's the creator God. All of the attributes of the Godhead are attributes of Jesus Christ. He is self-sufficient. In other words, he's not dependent upon anyone. He's the, the essence of all the characteristics of God himself or Jesus Christ. He's immutable. He's infinite. He's eternal. He's omnipotent. He's perfect. He's wisdom personified. He's truth. He's faithfulness. He's good. He's love. He's grace. He's mercy. He's long-suffering. Holy, just, full of glory, jealous. You know what else we believe when we say He's Lord? When we confess that, we believe in the Incarnation. We believe that God became man, as Philippians 2 clearly tells us it does. Jesus Christ came from the glories of heaven and entered into humanity and became a man. He is the God-man. And if we believe and confess that He's Lord, then we also not only believe in the Incarnation, but that means we believe in the virgin birth. Because that's how the Incarnation happened. So you can't just dismiss Lordship without dismissing all of those things. Because that's inherent to who He is. He became a man in the Incarnation. He was born of a virgin, Luke 2 tells us. He lived the life of on the earth in a perfect fashion in the form of a man we also have to believe inherent within the lordship of Christ is the reality of who we are our sinful depravity because lordship and him being lord not only means that that's who he is by his very essence but it also means that he's the the master of all things, which means he's the master of all humanity, which means you, you can't get there by your works, and therefore you must believe that you are depraved. If you can get there, then he isn't Lord. Because you don't need one. And therefore, if we're sinful, we also believe, according to him being Lord, that his atonement was effectual. That he actually paid an atoning, satisfactory price so that we might have life in his name. That means we, he actually died. That means he actually is going to return in the future. That means, as we'll see in a moment, he actually rose from the dead. That means that he has a right to judge the world because he's God. That means the future, as it is stated here in the Scriptures, that He gave us is the way it's going to be. That it's true. That it's right. That all of the passages about the future to come are exactly as Jesus has laid it out. We believe also in Him as Lord. We believe that the Word of God that we have before us is in fact the Word of God. That it's without error, without fail. Sufficient for all things that we do have exactly as he has told us everything we need for life and godliness. You see, there are all kinds of implications in the fact that you just confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord. Not just words. So who is Jesus? That's the question. Who is Jesus? 
Listen to Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, All things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things. There's eternality. In Him are all, and in Him all things hold together. There's omnipotent power. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. There's resurrection. So that He Himself will come to have first place in everything. And why did all this happen? Because it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him and through Him to reconcile all things to Himself, having made peace through the blood of His cross. There's His death. Through Him, I say, whether things on earth or things in heaven. In a nutshell, Paul is saying to the believers in Colossae, listen, Jesus is everything. He's everything. He even says it in Revelation. I am the... Alpha and the Omega. The beginning of the Greek alphabet, the last letter of the Greek alphabet, he's just saying, I'm, I'm the beginning, I'm the end, and everything else in between. It, it's all for me. It's all because of me. So true Christianity, beloved, is all about Jesus. It's all about Him being who He is as the Bible declares it. Not as we make it up. As the Bible declares it, He is Lord. True Christians agree with God about that. And they proclaim that. They don't try to skirt around it because somehow they believe Christianity is some kind of feeling. It's not about how much emotions is involved. That's not what Christianity is about. It's not how much hype there is in my emotions and how the music got me into this frenzy of all kinds of emotional euphoria. No, it's about walk. It's not about walking forward at some meeting and saying, yeah, I believe, and somebody played just as I am 500 times. It's not about that. I'm not saying God doesn't sometimes save people in those foolish things. It's not about that. It's not about some superficial way about confessing that Jesus is Lord. The person through whom which all things have been made and to which every created being will one day bow. Did you know that? Every created being one day will bow to Jesus. They'll bow to Him. Every creature will acknowledge this very truth one day. Prior to are dying physically, the opportunity is to be saved by that confession. But there's coming a day when even saying that by the mouth won't save you. This truth about Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 10. Here's what Paul says. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It doesn't matter if you were saved or unsaved. Everybody before going into all eternity, whether it's hell or heaven, will confess with their mouth who Jesus is. They will come to the agreement with God This side of heaven, having that agreement with God from your heart is a must if you're going to be saved. Because this is what every true Christian confesses about Jesus. He's Lord. And that includes all of the implications that we've talked about. All of those things that come with that term. You may not understand all those things. You may not be able to articulate all those things. You may be like the blind guy in John chapter 9 who tells the Pharisees, listen, I don't know all the theological ramifications about it. All I know is I was blind, now I see, and it was Jesus. He was giving this testimony. It's about Jesus. That's what every true Christian believes. There is no Christianity without Jesus. So that's the first thing in true Christianity. 
Those who are true Christians confess Jesus as Lord. That's what Paul said. This, is, this would have been a, a hot button for Paul to say that to the Jews. Are you kidding me? Believe in Jesus? That guy's a blasphemer. That guy said he was God. That guy was a whack job. Paul says this is the only way. You confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord. And now there, there's another one here. Look at it. And believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. We know what Paul is saying. Right? You don't have to have a doctorate to figure it out what Paul is saying there. We clearly know at the very least that Paul is speaking of the factuality of the resurrection. There is no salvation without believing in the resurrection. It's a fact. This is very important. Because there are entire sects of Jews that Paul dealt with, they're still around today, and that many people, Jews and non-Jews alike, deny the actual factuality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I've told you this before, when I went to Israel several years ago, sitting in the, the, old, the, the city of Jerusalem with the person who was head of religious activities within the government of Jerusalem. We asked him questions. and That's the very question we asked him. Who is Jesus? And the answer he gave was telling as to what he believes concerning the resurrection and concerning the Lordship of Christ. He did not believe that Jesus was God. He was a good person. Helped a lot of people. And he said these very words, but he did not rise from the dead as some of you believe. Well, that's not what God said. So we know that this is a factual declaration. God said it. God's telling it now. And to confess is to agree with God's facts. So here is the facts. The tomb is empty. That's a fact. He's not there. That's a fact. He's been witnessed by many people. That's a fact. They're factual Testimony is declared throughout the rest of the New Testament. We have it. This is what they preached all throughout the beginning of the church. They always preached the resurrection. We don't have time this morning, but you can go to all the sermons through Acts. You can just walk your way through the book of Acts and listening to the sermons, and you will find the resurrection being proclaimed each time. It was about the resurrection of Jesus. Here's who Jesus is, and the tomb is empty. So here in Romans chapter 10, and verse 9, we are hearing that, that a Christian is someone who believes in his heart, right? He believes with his whole being. He believes in the, the depth of his very being. And therefore implies there's action in his life based upon that belief. It isn't belief if you don't walk according to it, if you don't do it. Right? We believe the water coming out of the ground is safe and we, know, we, do, we believe it. By drinking it. If we didn't believe it, we wouldn't drink it. When you believe, you act upon it. And so therefore, here it implies action. The resurrection is an absolute fact, and believing, we live according to that. Paul says to Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, remember, verse 8 and 9, remember Jesus Christ, risen from the dead, Descendant of David, according to my gospel. It's essential to the gospel. Paul says, it's this gospel for which I suffer hardship, even to imprisonment as a criminal. So listen, I preach the resurrection. I preach Jesus is Lord. I, that's what I preach and all the ramifications included with that. And that causes me a whole lot of trouble in life. There's a whole lot of difficult for me with, for my life because I preach those things. This is what I preach. But you know what? The Word of God is not imprisoned, he says. They can imprison me all they want, but the Word of God isn't imprisoned. It's going out. It's doing what it does. Listen, beloved, that means the resurrection is essential for salvation because it's the Word of God. It is essential to the gospel. The 
gospel isn't that Jesus is love and God has a wonderful plan for your life. That's not the gospel. No, it's that Jesus is Lord and that he's risen from the dead. You know what that means? That means he died. If he rose from the dead, he actually died. Why did he have to die? See, that's the next question that has to be asked. If Jesus is Lord and Jesus rose from the dead, which means he died, why did he have to die? Because God is just. Because God must punish sin. And Jesus came so that we, the sinner, might have a way to God. He died a real, physical death. Even though he was an innocent man. So that we who are guilty before God might through Jesus be brought to God. Which also implies that his sacrifice was acceptable to God. That God accepted Christ. That God accepted Jesus. That, God's, that Christ's death was satisfactory enough to pay for your sins so that you could attain the righteousness in the gospel. And because his sacrifice was acceptable, he was risen from the dead, which proves his righteousness was acceptable. And so listen, when we believe that Jesus was risen from the dead, you know what we're doing? We're confessing Jesus is Lord. We're confessing him as Lord. We're confessing that he's God. You say, how so? Because it's impossible for death to hold him. Acts chapter 2, verse 23 and 24. Death couldn't hold him. That was Peter's first message. He rose from the dead. Death could not hold him. You know why death can't hold him? Because he's God. He rules over all that. He's Lord. That's why death couldn't hold him. So when we believe in our heart that Jesus has been raised... We are believing that Jesus is who He said He is, right? Now Paul says that if we confess and genuinely believe in your heart these truths, you shall be saved. That's what he says. I love that. That's like an exclamation point at the end of the period, or at the end of the sentence. It's an ironclad promise from God. If this is true in your heart, you shall be saved. Why do we understand that to be true? Why do we understand this to be true? Notice verses 10 through 13. Because with the heart, man believes. You see, this, this is from this depth, which is unto righteousness. Right? Salvation comes by faith. That's the same, he's saying the same thing. Righteousness comes through faith. Faith in Christ. Faith, in belief. faith is belief. Believing he's Lord. Believing he's raised from the dead. Believing that he's God. Believing all those things. And with your mouth, you confess, resulting in or showing salvation. So it isn't confession that's saving you. Confession is showing the reality of what happened by believing. Faith is saving. Confession is the outwork of that. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So Paul says that we believe these things. He's implying at the same time that you're committed to all of the truth about Jesus, all of the doctrine about you, all of the truth about your desperate need for a Savior, you're, you're, you're believing and committing to all of that. See, the, tr the true Christian doesn't just simply believe that God forgives sin because He's love, and if I say certain words in an intellectual way, then the Bible says, hey, I'm saved. There are people draw this verse out all the time. These two verses, draw them out and just use that as this ironclad stamp that whatever you do, as long as you say the words, you're saved. Not true. No, Christianity is all about Jesus. He's God. He rose from the dead. Therefore, that means that he is at the right hand of the Father. He's there interceding for those 
for whom he died and for whom he rose again. To believe unto salvation is to believe everything about Jesus. Whatever God says about Jesus, I believe it. You can't believe that Jesus is Lord and that God has raised him from the dead without believing all of the other declarations about Jesus in the Bible. You can't separate them. You can't separate God's love from God's wrath. It's his very essence. It's who he is. They're, not, they're inseparable. And so Paul is declaring, notice, thankfully, whoever believes, whoever believes, right? If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Why? Because with the heart man believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses to salvation, for the scripture says, Whoever believes in him will not be disappointed. Quoting Isaiah. Whoever believes isn't going to be disappointed. That's a promise of God. It's ironclad. doesn't matter who you are. There's no distinction. doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek. doesn't matter if you're, according to the Jewish mind, inside the family or outside the family. For the same is Lord of all. And he has enough riches for all who call upon him. That's a synonym for faith. All who say, I believe, I trust. Whoever, whoever, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. To call upon the name of the Lord is just to say, I have faith in, what, in God. I have faith in Jesus Christ. I have faith in everything. I agree with God and all that he said. I trust that. I know I need mercy. I know I need his grace. I know without him I have no hope. It's impossible for me to think that I could gain righteousness on my own. What a foolish venture that is. I know I need a Savior. I know God is the Savior. Jesus Christ is the Savior. And so I trust him. God says, if that's genuine in your heart, you'll be saved. And you know how we'll know it? You'll live by it. It'll show in your life. So where are you? Where are you today? See, Paul's saying, I plead with you to believe. Believe in your heart unto righteousness. Show your belief by your confession, proving salvation. <clears throat> This is the most important day of your life. The most important day of your life. I, I want to end our time this morning where we started a bit ago when we read the scriptures. Go back to Psalm 16. And I just want to let the psalmist once again... Speak to us. And I'm going to read two Psalms this morning, 15 and 16. O Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? That's really the question we've been asking, right? Who can be a Christian? Who can stand before a holy God? He who walks with integrity and works righteousness speaks truth in his heart, does not slander with his tongue, nor does evil to his neighbor, nor takes up a personal reproach against his friend in whose eyes a reprobate is despised, who honors those who fear the Lord, who swears to his own hurt and does not change. He does not put out his money at interest, nor does he take a bribe against the innocent. He who does these things will never be shaken. He's not saying you can work your way to righteousness. What the psalmist is saying there is that, that shows righteous activity in your life. And then Psalm 16 says, Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. I said to the Lord, You are my Lord. I have no good beside you. As for the saints who are in the earth, they are the majestic ones in whom is all my delight. I love the believer. I love the one who loves you. The sorrows of those who have bartered for another God, their sorrows are going to be multiplied. I'm not going to pour out their libations of blood, nor I'm not going to take their names upon my lips. 
In other words, I'm not going to keep company with those who hate you. The Lord is the portion of my inheritance in my cup. You support my lot. The lines have fallen to me in pleasant places. Indeed, my heritage is beautiful to me. So I bless the Lord who has counseled me. Indeed, my mind instructs me in the night. I've set the Lord continually before me because he is at my right hand. I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my glory rejoices. My flesh also will dwell securely. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. Neither will you allow your Holy One to undergo decay. That's why you won't abandon us to Sheol because Christ never went to decay. Christ rose from the dead. We're secure in Christ. You'll make known to me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. In your right hand, there are pleasures forever. What an exclamation point on the words of the Apostle Paul. Whoever will call upon my name, whoever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let's pray. Father, once again, we are grateful, grateful that we could have an opportunity to just open your word freely, without danger. You've brought us here this morning by your providential plan to hear these things. Some have come here rejecting. Some have come here even deceptively convinced that they know you when they don't. But you know. They've heard your words, and we pray that they would not walk out of here blind rejectors. But today would be the day of salvation, that you would cause their hearts to embrace the truth they've heard, to truly believe and know Jesus Christ as Lord. He truly has risen from the dead. And that in that believing, they are made righteous in Christ alone. And they confess that he is Lord. So that you are glorified in it all. And so that their lives begin, even now, to reflect that relationship they have with you. What a joy it is. What a change will take place. The miracle of the new birth. And so, Lord, we pray that you would change all of us because of this truth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.